thanks everyone for your attention in advance. Uh, so my name is Murli, um, and all this other stuff is just for show. And uh, so I'm a postdoc here at UCSD. And I'm going to talk today about uh, how you can use data mining techniques to investigate faults in HVAC systems. But more generally, what I want to kind of emphasize is the idea that uh, comparative data mining, which is when you have data from many buildings, many homes, many rooms, uh, is actually kind of useful in energy systems. So this is uh, joint work with my advisors, Yuvraj and uh, Rajesh, and my advisor and basically everything else, Bharat. So whose talk is tomorrow, so you should attend. Uh, so, so first, why should you listen to this talk and not all the other ones? It's because, so first of all, commercial buildings are very, very important. You know, they have a fairly large part of the total energy consumption, at least in the US. And within these commercial buildings, the HVAC systems are also very, very important because they, again, capture about 40% of this energy consumption. Uh, but uh, one point which we may not quite realize is uh, thinking of buildings as kind of you know, non-living systems is that they are actually very, very complex. So they have things like many thousands of lights, and people complain if even one light goes out. You know, it, uh, elevators, for example, are very large energy hogs, and they're very dynamic. They're on sometimes, not on sometimes. And they have very, very strong requirements. You get complaints from you know, certain kinds of people if the temperature goes up and down by even a single degree. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, <laughs> certain kinds of people. <laughs> no, it, yeah, no, it, so, and I'll get to actually why this auditorium is cold at the end of my talk. So, uh, and it turns out that HVAC systems, which you can't quite see here, but they're very, very complex. And uh, Rahul actually had a very nice diagram of you know, the HVAC system of a campus. But they have many, many moving parts, which we also don't think about very often. So for example, they'll have at least even a small building has many tens of very, very large fans. They have large pumps, which you, again, hopefully you will see some of them today in the, at lunch and many, many hundreds of dampers that control different rooms. And all these are dynamic, moving, changing all the time. And buildings, and we want them to be even smarter, right? So we want things like, you know, they're becoming slowly better sensed, they are more and more controllable, and we want them to be as smart and personalized as possible. So we might want that part of the room to be slightly warmer because, you know, Yuvraj is from India, like we are. <laughs> or, you know, so uh, these things, uh, what is the effect of this? The effect of this is that b buildings are basically becoming complexer, you know. Uh, so just to take the example that we are, you know, the most familiar with, this is the very pretty CSE building, which is the one, again, you might see later today. So it's a fairly small building, and it's quite new, right? So 237 zones is about half the number of rooms that the building has. It's only four floors. And Yet, you know, even just the simple uh, data that's being collected right now is something like uh, has 5,000 sensors distributed across it. And what we don't quite think about often is that these sensors are actually another layer of complexity. So not only do we have to worry whether the fan is not working, we have to worry whether the fan sensor is not working. And, but, you know, the good thing about these things is that, you know, data, which is, you know, very important to us data people. So the question is, how can you use this data more intelligently? But the point is that you know, com as complexity increases, the faults increases. So this is uh, some data actually taken from, uh, you know, it's very scary when the paper is written by someone in the audience. And I imagine Marianne looking at this quite disapprovingly. But uh, the point is that you know, in the simple studies, many, many buildings, uh, they have, have a large number of faults. And what other people have shown is that there's a large potential of energy savings. So if you think about, you know, 40% of commercial energy is being consumed in buildings, and they could use 40% less, right? And, you know, simple experiments where they actually tried to fix a lot of these faults showed that you can actually get verified. That is, show that by fixing faults in buildings, you can save a large amount of energy. So who wouldn't want to do that? So it's obvious that once people realized that you should, so there, are, there is what is called fault detection and diagnosis, which a lot of people have looked at. And you can think of uh, you know, a number of different uh, uh, techniques of different complexity to look at these things from just simple alarms to rules to statistical methods and so on. 
one problem that kind of happens is that even though you have all this stuff in theory, what the people in a facilities uh, typically have to look at is something that like this, right? So it's just a chart, you know, with some numbers over here, some names, you know, 852B, and then something else over here, and then a bunch of alarms, right? And these just keep popping up if you try to open this, and it's, it's very, very hard to look at. So what happens is basically you have a data deluge. To give you an idea of this, per day on the UCSD campus, you get 10,000 such alarms popping up. Right? So it's impossible to think about anyone actually looking at any of these alarms, fixing any of these alarms, considering that there may be 30 people working for this thing. Right? So what can you do? Okay? So the prior work in trying to find faults automatically and more intelligently can be very loosely uh, combined into a few different ideas, rule-based, model-based, and change-based. So I apologize in advance. I mean, the first part of this talk is very picturey, so I'll bore half of you, and the second half is more technical, and I'll bore the remaining people, and then I'll run over time and piss off you, Brad. So, you know. so what is a rule-based method? So a rule-based method is very simple, which is that if I'm heating the building but it's still cold, then raise an alarm. Right? And you can think of slightly more complicated rules, but this is typically what you would do. Model-based buildings, uh, you know, drawing on models like what uh, Rahul was talking about in the morning and so on are more complicated. And they say that, you know, if I heated the building, then I expect, you know, airflow, hot air to go up like this, this part of the building to be so hot, this part of the building to be so cold. But actually, I got something else. So raise an alarm. And then finally, there are kind of the more data-driven or change-based methods which say things like, the last time I heated the buildings, the sensors told me that you know the room was probably the house was probably properly heated and everyone was fine. But this time, when I tried to heat the building, it was all cold. So raise an alarm. So while cartoonish, I think this kind of characterizes the, these kind of methods. So what is wrong with all of these? So rule-based methods have to be fairly building and climate specific. So you, what is an alarm in one building may be normal in uh, San Diego, for example. And models tend to be very, very hard to build, and you, we heard all of that in Rahul's talk, and I think we'll hear more about it later. And the problem with change-based uh, methods is that they don't handle what I would call long-standing faults. So it turns out that when a building is built, there are a lot of faults in a building, in the way they are configured and so on, and no change-based method can detect these because they never change. They're always wrong. So what we want to do is try to come up with at least one method that can fix some of these things and combine them more intelligently. So what is this talk about? So basically, uh, what I will do is so that this comparative data mining technique can find long-standing faults in our building test bed. We actually find a fairly large number of them. And the idea is that uh, when we have a building with 400 rooms or 237 zones, you can compare zones to each other. So even if you don't know what a fault is, you can always tell that this zone is very, very different from some other zones. So maybe there is a fault. And this tends to be more robust to differences in buildings and so on. And the highlight is that it's almost largely completely data driven. So it was done by me, who knows nothing about buildings. So it should work in other places with other people who don't know about buildings. And at the end, I'll kind of, you know, not quite get into it, but I'll, what I want to say is that there is still room for human in the loop. So the idea is not to replace humans completely with, you know, data, but there is a lot of benefit to the 80-20 rule, which is you do data mining to find something and then ask humans what to do with that information. So uh, basically, uh, now I'll just, I kind of hopefully convinced you that fault detection and diagnosis is important. And now uh, I'll go over some little bit about the HVAC system before getting into some algorithmic details. So the HVAC system, even at this cartoonish form, is fairly complicated. Uh, so it has two parts. One is the cold water, cold or cooling part, and the heating part. Forgive the technical language. Uh, so the idea is basically that, in, at least on our campus, we have a central plant which provides cold water. And this is, you know, uh, air is passed near, near enough to this water to become cold. And this cold air is pumped into rooms and zones and so on, cooling them. And the air is returned. And then the cold water becomes slightly hotter and then circulates around campus. Similarly, we have a hot water system, 
which takes in hot water, and you want to keep these two as separate as possible, so you don't want to heat and cool at the same time. And this kind of is the more complicated HVAC system, but what we're actually going to talk about today is what I call VAV boxes, which is where in the room this hot air is pumped in and this cold air is pumped in and so on. So uh, what are these VAV boxes? VAV boxes are variable air volume, and so, and uh, basically what they are is a zone-specific control device. You can think of a zone as a room, though it's not always the right mapping. And what they have is essentially a bunch of sensors. So for every room, you would know, you know what is the temperature there and how, much, how, how fast air is being pumped in. And they have actuators, right, which are things like the damper position. So you want to let in more air, let in less air, and so on. And interestingly, you have set points, which is how cold or how hot a room should be, how much air you should blow in, and control signals. So is the room occupied right now? Do I want to heat it? Do I want to cool it? And again, going back to the point of complexity, each of these things can fail. So sensors can fail, right? And you no longer get readings or you get wrong readings. Actuators can fail. Dampers often get stuck in open and closed positions, so you always have air flowing. And you can have software errors on the set point. So the set points are just set wrong because someone had to go to each room and set them manually. And they may have you know, entered a decimal place in the wrong place or whatever. And, and finally, you have communication control problems. That is, you ask a room to heat, but it does not, and so on. And what happens is that they have a lot of side effects that you wouldn't like. So wind chill, for example, if air is blowing, but it's not very cold, you still feel colder than it actually is. And uh, there's obviously a lot of energy wastage and hardware deterioration. So for example, if dampers keep flipping on and off, they tend to get spoiled very quickly. So let's look at what we could do with the data and what a solution should look like. Right? So one easy way for anomaly detection, right, or fault detection in a data point, in with lots of data, is to look at what is called the principal component. So principal components are the directions in which your sensor readings tend to lie in some high dimensional space, right? Uh, so if we look at, so what we did was we collected this data for about a year uh, for 237 zones in the CSC building. And just for, you know, to draw them, I've looked at the first two uh, eigen directions. For those of you who don't know what it is, you can, it turns out that this is essentially the amount of airflow in a room, and this is essentially the temperature. You can see the ranges are about right. So now if you ask someone or you, 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 know, you tried an algorithm to find anomalies in this data, which we did, what it tends to do is it finds extremes in these. So basically the anomalies that an algorithm would detect are the server room, which has to be always cold, and the basement rooms, which are very, very large, and they tend to have a lot of airflow. So these would be anomalies. And finally, this is a very interesting anomaly in our building, which I think Rahul actually had a picture very similar to it, which was the thermostat in one of the kitchens was behind the water heater. So what happens is that it basically it's a red temperatures of the order of 90 degrees. Right? And so it's an anomaly, but it's not clear what you would actually do. But this is a very, very extreme case. So the point is that working directly with sensor readings tends to just find large sensor readings. And this is probably not very informative, though it can be useful. Right. So uh, the other idea is that a lot of these rules and models and so on are quite generic, and, you'd, and you expect them to work across you know, different buildings and different climates and so on. But if you actually look at it, and this actually goes back to something Brewster briefly mentioned, uh, which is that if you look at even in one building, which is the CSC building, if you look at the east-facing rooms and the west-facing rooms, right, you see that the west-facing rooms tend to have this very large peak of temperature in the afternoons, but the east-facing rooms are fairly temperate, you know, thanks to this being San Diego. Even if you don't heat or cool them, they're not too bad at all, right? So there is a large difference between zones on the same day, so it's unrealistic to expect that a single rule or a single threshold would even work across two different rooms in the same building in the same place. So you want something much more adaptive to the data that you actually have. So uh, then the next thing we tried after these rule-based methods was essentially change-based methods. And what is a change-based method? Anomaly says, if you remember, that uh, there was something in the process history that had a certain model or a certain characteristic, and this suddenly changed. 
So when we ran this on the data, it actually generated a number of anomalies, but they were kind of interesting in certain ways, which is the first kind of anomaly was that we have these DR events every few, every few months or so, and, and the day we had the DR event, basically all the change-based methods start pushing and saying that you know, all the rooms are anomalous today, which seems fairly unlikely. Right? And the other thing which is also fairly common is that for a few, no few hours in one day, we had no data from any of the rooms. So it just selected rooms and then said these are all anomalous, even though all the rooms had basically the same missing data. And the other thing is, uh, so on certain days, it's always warmer or cooler than other days. So we had a day which was slightly warmer than normal for San Diego. It's still, you know, in the 70s, which is, you know, for San Diego, that was hot. And all the rooms started increasing temperature slightly. And the change-based algorithms say, oh, if the temperature increased, so this is an anomaly. So what happens with change-based methods is that they are often very sensitive to confounding parameters like external temperature, the room facing, and so on. So putting it together, we have these three problems that I discussed, and what we want is to kind of account for all these things. So how do we avoid working with sensor reading directly? We want to build models, you know, kind of like, but simpler than the ones Rahul was talking about in the morning, but th that actually capture the interrelationship between sensors and actuators in a room, rather than just looking at the sensor readings directly. And to account for large differences between zones, what we want to do is cluster rooms with the same characteristics. So we want to consider anomalies on east-facing rooms, west-facing rooms, and also independently. And to, pro to again, to account for the sensitivity to confounding parameters, we want to compare rooms that have the same confounding parameters and then declare anomalies. So very creatively, we call this method model cluster compare. Right? So I'll talk a little bit about this method. So the, the idea is that what we do is we just take the data, and for each room, we build black box statistical models connecting the various sensor readings, cluster those model parameters rather than the sensor readings, and compare them using any anomaly detection technique. So what I'll talk about now is a very first cut kind of method where we use linear models of the sensor parameters. Uh, and we use a very commonly used clustering algorithm called k-means. It doesn't matter if you know, don't know what these are, because there are many, many, many alternatives. So you can, you know, combinatorial number of alt alternatives, and you can see what works. And I think that's kind of an interesting direction to figure out what's the right thing to do. So, uh, so the idea behind uh, the modeling step of MCC is that all the sensors and actuators are all sensing and actuating the same spatio-temporal space in some sense. So they, they have what is called analytic redundancy or you know, simpler ideas, correlation. So the sensors will, so if you increase airflow, temperature will go down, right? And this is captured by any model coefficients. So for example, we use a linear model, right? And we say that you know, the energy consumption is some linear function of the sensor and actuator readings plus noise. And you can just learn these sensor and actuator readings and look at, for example, where the coefficients are high, and this gives you a characterization of that room. Right? And what we th then you can do is, and what we have done, is we built models for each of the zones using some amount of data. And here again, we look at the different directions, right? just the first two eigendirections. These are uh, hard to interpret, and, but what we see is that uh, they are kind of much more tightly clustered, I would say, and the extremes are very different kinds of rooms. Uh, and I'll talk about what uh, these anomalies are in a little bit of detail later on. So how do you decide if something is an anomaly or not? Uh, we use uh, k-means clustering, and we actually use a specific version of that called k-means++. For those of you who know about these things, never use k-means, always use k-means++. It's better, you know, it has two pluses at the end. So, uh, and what we do is then you, you pick some number of clusters, and what the, an interesting question which is open in both machine learning and all applications is how many clusters should you use? And then you look at points that are far away from these cluster centers, right? And I'll go over a few of these just to give a quantitative idea of what anomalies look like. So one interesting anomaly that this immediately caught out, which was kind of the largest anomaly according to this algorithm, was one room where uh, actuation and sensing were not in sync. What that means is that whenever it was unoccupied, 
it was cooling it a lot, dropping the temperature. And whenever it was occupied, the reverse happened. Right? So essentially, somewhere in the software, there's a flip between the, what the occupied is doing and what the unoccupied is doing. It's not a big anomaly because temperatures don't really drift that much in San Diego. And it's always kind of within the range, but it's a clearly misconfigured rule. Uh, and another anomaly, which is uh, kind of fairly common, unfortunately, and this is kind of why this conference room is too cold, is that uh, you have to condition a room for the maximum occupancy by law. So that is, unless you know how many people there are, you have to condition this room, assuming it's going to be full. So there is something called an airflow set point. So that is, as long as it's occupied, the airflow has to be at least this much. So what then happens is that even if the room was fine before you started moving it into occupied mode, it gets overcooled if it is occupied less than you think it should be. And then it keeps getting colder and colder the whole time until you release it again. And what we found is that this is very, very common in most of the office rooms here. And, it's, and I'll get to a more interesting complication that happens next. Okay. So another kind of anomaly that happens is that we found that for a reasonably large number of rooms, the fact that the set points are supposed to change at the same time every day, which is when we think it's going to be occupied. I think Yuvraj spoke briefly about that. But for a number of rooms, this change doesn't happen. And again, the model building step kind of figures out that these changes which should be happening aren't. And what we found for other rooms is that uh, many of them still get high cooling, low cooling, and so on when they shouldn't, when they're unoccupied, and so on. So an interesting kind of anomaly is, uh, which we found is what I call a dynamic anomaly. And this is kind of, again, ties into why you want to look at models. So what happens in this room is that it has a very high set point, like this one, for example. So the air blows uh, very high as soon as it becomes occupied. And what happens is that, as a result, the room starts cooling down. right? And what happens is then that it goes below the lower set point, which is now saying the room is too cold. And as a result, what the algorithm starts doing is then it starts heating the room again. So even though the outside temperature is quite warm, it's warmer than it is inside, the, it, the room, uh, you get this kind of dynamic anomaly in particularly conference rooms where they, the room gets cool and that causes heating and then cooling and heating and cooling and heating. And in a campus like UCSD, given our energy system, heating is a big waste of energy. And you should never, ever heat a room if you don't want to. And unfortunately, what we find is that what we found after looking at this is by law, you, you have to look at occupancy. So, and not just is a room occupied or not, but you want occupancy counts. How many people are in the room? And use that to set the... Uh, and so this is why this conference room. So it's going to start heating it. Right. So uh, one problem we found is looking at all these kind of data mining kind of algorithms is that they have different characteristics and tend to pop up different kinds of anomalies, but they won't find all instances of an anomaly. So if you asked it to find all heating cooling anomalies, it'll po it, it doesn't do that. It'll say, okay, this heating cooling anomaly, this uh, airflow anomaly, and so on, and just pop them up to you with no context. So the solution that we have is that you show these exemplar anomalies to some naive person, namely me, and ask me to write a rule that can identify these in the rest of the data. And we call these I rules, you know, uh, it's for intelligent rules. So, and they are very easy to write. So if I gave you an example like the one, the previous one, you just say, you know, room cooled and then started heating. So this is an anomaly. Give me all examples of this. And then what we did was we collected all these kinds of anomalies that the different data mining algorithms popped up. And another interesting one that change detection algorithms do detect is what I call a short cycling anomaly, which is basically the airflow or the damper position just keeps jumping up and down, up and down. And this is fairly bad for lifetime of hardware. And what we find is that these I rules, once you look at one example of it, they're very easy to write. And they, they have a very good, uh, they found basically a lot of anomalies. So just out of 237 zones, we have you know, more than 50% of them have some kind of anomaly or the other. And the interesting thing is that these I rules have very low false alarm. So you, are, you can write very strict rules, one for each kind of anomaly, and they tend not to get confused very badly. 
So to conclude, basically buildings are a big source of data, you know, possibly too big. So you start have to you do have to worry about how do you do data mining, visualization, how do people interact with this data, and so on. And despite data, you know, you have all these sensor readings for four, five, six, ten years, but there are still these faults that have never been fixed in a building. So data-driven anomaly detection is useful, and generalization is often hard. So you want to look at the data that you do have and try to do some kind of comparative data mining. And what we found is that kitchens, conference rooms, these kind of common areas which are very, very rare and large and consume a lot of energy are often misconfigured in some sense. So what you want to do is basically occupant-based control. And finally, the bigger conclusion is that data mining is good, but human in the loop is better. So you want to kind of think about these questions. So we were asked to kind of end with some future work, but there are you know, many specific questions in comparative data mining itself. For example, how many clusters, other clustering methods, and how you do fault diagnosis. So given that this is a fault, why did it happen? And this is a very hard question for pure data mining. And you want to look at better room models like the kind Rahul was talking about in the morning. And you want to see how this works for you know, buildings or houses in other climates and in other places. And the more general or high level question is, where is the line between human and data mining? Where should it be drawn? So you want to be able to do things like automatic rule generation. So you want to remove that part at least a little bit. Uh, and there's a big question of what is anomalous. And we, in general, are better at it than computers. Uh, and you want to look at, can you automatically fix software and hardware errors uh, without humans at all, or as little human involvement as possible? And so I'm just going to end there. It counts animated slides as. <laughs> yeah. For your talks, did you go, did you, it seems like uh, all faults would not be feasible, right? Some would save you a lot of money, some would save yeah. you a little money, some would be easy to fix, some would be hard to fix. Did you do sort of any analysis or did your rule kind of start to get at that? So uh, the second part, completely no. So how do you, how hard or easy it is to fix? I don't think there's an easy way to figure that out. And for the first part, actually, so Yuvraj and his group have had work on what they call zone pack, which is how do you measure each zone's energy consumption, even if you don't have an energy sensor there. So what we are looking at is if you fix an anomaly, this is what it should look like. And what is the energy consumption before and after using zone pack? And so this is in, so we, we will do this, but not yet. So, but we, I think the second one is a bit hard, which is how hard or easy is it to fix? So, I mean, it may be if you talk to the building experts that you work with, they'll be able to yeah. tell you yeah. which yeah. ones are easy and which ones are harder. Right. Oh, and so I meant hard automatically. Oh, yes. I was thinking like. Ask them. Ask them. Just fix. Yeah. 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 Oh. Because of the visualization here, or yes, it is because of the visualization. Are more I... significant right, so there are about eight. So we have 17 sensors, and the first eight capture about 98% of the energy. And that's what we used for the algorithm, but to plot it, I just showed. Right, so I think, uh, so the question could be between why did we stop at linear models is that they do seem to capture a lot of what we care about. And also the structure of the model is more important. So you want to know, is there a relationship between airflow, is there a strong relationship between airflow and temperature? You don't really care about how strong it is. So, I mean, do you understand? As in, you don't care whether this, the correlation is 0.5 or 0.6, but you care that it's greater than 0.3. Right. Uh, 
but as uh, like i left it here is we would want to look at whether non linear models are worth the extra effort for this application yeah is there an assumption that there is going to be a good number of companies uh, being willing to invest in this for the number of people who have the technical skill building that so many people who So this again is uh, this question, which is what is anomalous, and this is uh, I don't know, I want to say it's a data mining question, which is uh, it it depends, and if you're that bad off, I think you know someone else should be uh, worrying about. It. But uh, there is always a big question of is something anomalous or not, even given the model parameters, and this isn't like an open machine learning thing, and I don't think there's a right answer. So it, what is an anomaly depends on the application.